American humorist Will Rogers, who sadly was killed in a plane crash in 1935 with Wiley Post, was, walk, was talking about anger once. This is what he said. Whoever flies off the handle seldom makes for a good landing. And so it is true that when people are uh, emotionally um, overwrought, sometimes depressed, it can come out in anger. That was true in the early church in Acts chapter 6. We'll talk about that tonight. Pastor Mark Kinsley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church with my camera woman, Laura. Hi, Laura. Great to have each of you watching. Let us know how we can pray for you and how you're doing. Uh, continue to pray for Ernie Sturdivant. He's recovering from foot surgery. Uh, pray for those who are dealing with uh, grief. I think of uh, Vicki Dibble and the death of her grandson. And just uh, pray as the Lord gives you uh, discernment. And let's uh, thank him for tonight. <coughs> Lord, thank you for this evening. We're grateful for this uh, time together in your word. Guide uh, our time as we study. But also we thank you for a successful surgery for Ernie. Pray for a full recovery. And Lord, thank you for uh, encouraging and lifting up the hearts that are dealing with grief uh, right now. And folks who are facing other challenges, we just commit this night to you and are grateful for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Acts chapter 6, <coughs> excuse me, in Acts chapter 6, we're introduced to the early um, administrative detail of the church the deacons, and they come into focus because there was frustration, no doubt anger, and uh, disagreements, sharp disagreements, between the Hebraic Jewish people in the church and those who are called the Hellenists. The Hellenists people spoke Greek. They were uh, Greek-speaking. The uh, other group, the um, Hebraic Jews, spoke Aramaic. So there was, uh, even though they were both Jewish peoples, they were disagreeing uh, over the distribution of food to widows in the church. So it, it came down to a ministry uh, frustration, um, an, an assumption that people were being shortchanged, and it created stress <coughs> and pressure on the disciples. And so we read about it tonight in Acts chapter 6, beginning of verse 1. In those days, the disciples were increasing in number. There arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews, remember they speak Greek, and against the Hebraic Jews, they spoke Aramaic, that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. And it doesn't uh, say it in this context, this version I should say, but evidently they gave out a certain amount of food to the widows of uh, Jewish members who were in the uh, early church as it was beginning to grow, and they felt like they were being left out. <clears throat> Have you ever felt like you were on the short end of the stick? Uh, maybe you had wanted to do something, and you thought you had plenty of time, and you found out you didn't. And when you went to, uh, to claim your uh, token or your prize or your food basket, they were all out, and, uh, and you just had to walk away. Well, in a very real sense, there's tension brewing in the early church. What do you do when people within the body of Christ sometimes get a little bit crossways with one another? Someone said it doesn't take <coughs> much size to criticize. And so even though we're saved, we're forgiven, we've been redeemed, we still have within us an old nature that is very sensitive to being slighted. And uh, sometimes we say this, and you may sometimes hear people say this in a church, I know my rights. And I always want to say to them, well, what rights does a dead person have? We are buried with Christ into baptism, into death, but just as like as Christ was rose up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Basically, when we were saved, our life became eclipsed by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he lives out through us. So sometimes uh, it might be just better to not raise an issue and just let the Lord deal with whatever it is that's bothering you. But um, in this context, they can't do that. They have to get this settled, and so they do. And you'll notice <clears throat> that the 12, the disciples, summoned the whole company of the disciples— 
<clears throat> so this is an early church gathering. <clears throat> yeah, I guess you could think of it as kind of like an early church business meeting. But they're coming together and they're going to put their heads together, but more importantly, their hearts together and solve the issue with the unfair distribution of food to two different people groups within the newly growing church. And so here's what they decide. The disciples make an interesting comment. It would not be right for us <clears throat> to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Now that is not a dismissive comment. The disciples are simply saying in the ministry of the Lord, there is a hierarchy of expectation. And for instance, servants, we should all be servants. By the way, do you know how you can tell if someone's a servant or not? For instance, on a Sunday morning, if there's a, a tissue on the floor or something that needs to be cleaned up, a servant will clean it up. A servant won't wait for the janitorial you know, group to show up. They will just do what's immediately in front of them. That's what a servant does. In this passage, the disciples aren't saying it's wrong to be a servant, not at all. But because God has gifted the church and people with so many diverse and wonderful gifts, it frees up the disciples to do what God primarily called them to do, which is to preach and teach the Word of God. I am, as you all know, because you've heard me say it many times, I'm surrounded by really talented people. I really am. I have a wonderful ministerial assistant in Shelley who serves the Lord uh, in such a wonderful way. She's, she has diverse gifts. Uh, with the praise team, they, they do what many times I can't do with instruments. You have our deacons who care for widows and widowers. You have just a, a wonderful cross-section of talented people that, that do the things that maybe no one knows they do them, but if they didn't do them, you'd know it. Someone was talking recently, Laura, about Karen, and they said, who's the one that takes care of the flowers and the shrubbery around the church? And they mentioned Karen. And they just said, she does such an amazing job. And she does. And Fred does an amazing job. 89-year-old head of the building and grounds, making sure everything looks like it should. I'm looking at a lady right now, does a lot of things behind the scenes. And she, uh, she takes care of camera work right now. She will edit this. She will make it presentable because she offers that gift to the Lord. I have no clue how to do what she does. What Ben does, have no clue. Um, I just, I would be of no help to them. In fact, I've even said to Lauren Ben many times, just point me to the pulpit, right? Just, just let me do what I do, which is teach. But here's the deal, folks. I couldn't do this with any degree, any modicum of success or benefit to those who watch if I didn't have surrounding me people that take care of so many other things so I can focus on the preaching or teaching of the word. That's what the disciples are saying in Acts chapter 6. So in verse 3, they tighten the decision. <coughs> Pardon me, brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation. You're now going to hear the characteristics of a godly, God-appointed deacon. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good Reputation. Well, let's just stop there. What is a reputation? It's really who you are. Uh, someone said character is who you are in the dark. Reputation is the way you handle yourself, the way you handle uh, your emotions, the way you handle finances, the way you are faithful or not faithful to any given cause. For instance, uh, I don't think you would continue to go to a doctor who was not adept at what he does. When you're looking for someone, someone to work on your car, a dentist, you'll talk to your friends and you'll say, do you know anybody? And again, it's the reputation that many times precedes the interaction with a new client or a new patient because what they've done in the past has spoken to someone's life and they want to share it with others. So select from among you seven men of good reputation. Not only good reputation, they had to be full of the Spirit. We both know, Lord, I know, and you know as you're watching this, that uh, the Lord Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. 
but unless I go away, the Comforter can't come. And of course, he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit that you read about in the early chapters of the book of Acts. The Lord ascends to the right hand of the Father 40 days after his death, burial, and his resurrection. And then about uh, so many days after that, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes on the church, tongues of flame landing on each person's head. They began proclaiming the gospel in words and languages they never learned. And God moves on them and he fills them. I liked how Adrian Rogers defined the Holy Spirit. He said it's Christ in the Christian. And here he says, if you want to have men of God who will be servants in the strictest sense, in the highest order, they must have a good reputation. They must be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. A spirit-filled person is one who is walking in intimacy with the Lord, a person whose decisions and speech and actions are directed by the Lord. It doesn't mean they're sinless. It just means that their life has been yielded to God, and it's evidential in how they interact and treat other people. There's a reason why uh, the Bible says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. What that means is you've got to observe someone. Uh, anybody can have a, a good initial beginning. Anybody can come across impressive. But someone who is faithful over time will be uh, someone the congregation can, can see and notice and observe. So they had to be full of the Holy Spirit, of good reputation. They had to have wisdom. The wisdom is the ability to discern uh, decisions based on what does the Word of God say, uh, what is the best course of action, the Bible says the multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. So we seek the counsel of godly people. All those things come together to make a decision. And so, basically, he says, once you find someone like that, men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. So that's the case. We're going to, in the early church, we're going to find a group of men, seven of them, that we can basically divest this concern to. We can, we can do something called, uh, we can delegate. <laughs> That's where you let other people handle it. Pastors have to learn to delegate. If I try to do everything myself, I would not get anything done. I have to be very dedicated in my time. There's certain times, someone said this about a minister, the minister who's always available usually isn't worth much when he is. There are times when I have to sequester myself away from everything to concentrate on preparing a message, to pray, to seek the face of God. And if I don't uh, have that time, uh, it affects me negatively. It really does. Jesus modeled that. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, <clears throat> the Bible says of our Lord, He, rising up a great while before day, departed to a solitary place and prayed. If the Son of God needed quiet and intimacy with God the Father, how much more do we in these crazy days in 2021? And so once that appointment's made, here's what the disciples are going to do. Verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So many times people are talking about church growth and how can a church grow. I think it's summarized in that verse. We will devote ourselves to prayer. Do you notice prayer is first and then to the ministry of the word. Prayer will not get you everything you want, but prayer will get you everything God wants you to have. Pray, the Bible says, without ceasing. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. I encourage you to pray for this church. I encourage you to continue to support this church. We're right now behind in our budget. We're facing some uh, deficits that we're not used to. But the best thing I know to do is bring it to the Lord in prayer and then bring it to his people. Because here's what I know about the people watching tonight. You will pray about that. And the Holy Spirit of God will speak to you about how you can be a part of, of us moving forward. <clears throat> prayer and ministry of the word are the two essentials to success and growth in ministry. Someone once said prayer and, and preaching or prayer and the word are like uh, the wings of a great bird. If both of them keep 
going, keep beating the air, they'll rise and they're sore. But if you let one fall or one the other one be neglected, you could just spiral out of control. So in the early church, they knew that they couldn't do everything. The disciples had to raise up godly people to take the initiative and in some of the other administrative efforts of the church. And then they were free to focus on preaching the word. I, I think of Dr. W. Criswell, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas from October 1944 to around January of 20, uh, I want to say 2000. So every bit of uh, over 50 years. He came from Oklahoma. He was in Muskogee, Oklahoma, born in Texline, Oklahoma in December of 1909. And he was a brilliant man. Uh, someone de described Dr. Criswell once as a holy roller with a PhD. <laughs> the church bought him a beautiful home on Swiss Avenue in Dallas. And he had his office, actually his study was uh, added to this beautiful home. And Dr. Criswell used to say what he would do, he said, I'd get up about 6 a.m. in the morning, I'd be in my pajamas and I'd go into my study and study myself silly to about noon. Then he'd get dressed and he'd do the work of the church in the afternoon. So he always would recommend to young preachers, give your mornings to God and your afternoon to the church. And of course, God used him. He really pastored one of the first mega churches in the United States. If he didn't carve time for preaching uh, and preparing, he would not be strong in the pulpit. In fact, it was Dr. W. Criswell who said the church that kneels longest stands longest and the church advances, listen to me, on its knees. So thank you for praying for this church. Thank you for giving to this church. Thank you for understanding that sometimes pastors have to delegate certain assignments. It doesn't mean they're too good to do those things. It just means there's a priority that we have to respect, which is prayer and the ministry of the word. And so... And this proposal, you say, well, how did it go? What did they think about this? I'm glad you're wondering that. Verse 5, this proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochnorus, and Nicanor, and Taman, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. And they, uh, if you'll notice, every one of those men are Greek. Those are Greek names. Remember where the dispute came up at? You had the Hellenistic Jews, they spoke Greek, and the Hebraic Jews who spoke Aramaic, who were in a disagreement over the distribution of food to widows in the early church. How prudent, how wise to make sure they picked men, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and by design they chose seven men who spoke Greek, who could identify with the people in the discussion and in the disagreement who felt they were being slighted. You know, God knows how to fix problems in the church. Aren't you glad? And when you have a troubled church, the best thing is for the people of God to come to him and he'll work those things out. <clears throat> so the word, so what happens? What happens when there's good organization in the church when the disciples, or in this context, the disciples, but in my context, a pastor or a minister is free to pray and preach the word. What are the results? Verse 7, so the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. What's interesting about that is that God gave them the answer to the dilemma, and then he blessed the solution. <laughs> He'll do the same for you and for me. So when it comes down to it, make sure that you hold your leaders accountable. Make sure those leaders are men of good reputation. I think sometimes the churches that, that call pastors and associate pastors and all the rest, <clears throat> I wouldn't put anybody in a position of leadership that we hadn't vetted. That's more difficult now in some ways because you don't necessarily know a person very well. Um, for instance, when, I, when we came here three years ago, <clears throat> we came in September of 2018. And the next month, of course, was the amazing Pastor Appreciation Month that 
this church um, excels in that. Wouldn't you agree, Laura? No church we've ever served has expressed more love to us continually through the month of October than this church. Wow. And I'm saddened because some churches don't honor pastors, and that's a whole other topic. But when I first came, you remember, I told the folks I was overwhelmed. I said, you don't even know me. I've been here a month. I said, this may be as good as it gets. And they loved us by faith. Now, after three years, I think the love is definitely deeper both ways. But it's because I'm a part of a church that understands the godly leadership is to be preferred over someone's appearance or how much money they have. People don't become a deacon in this church because they're rich. They may be. I don't know. I don't even know what people give. But they'll come and become a deacon in this church because they have a good reputation. They're full of the Holy Spirit. They're full of wisdom. And God's people have observed them and recommend them. And so just remember, um, you always want to be a part of a church where the leadership is transparent. They don't try to pull shade over your eyes. And they're men and or women of integrity. Their yes means yes. Their no means no. Next week, uh, we won't be meeting. Uh, Laura and I will be in North Carolina. We're attending a conference at the Billy Graham Cove and near Asheville. It's a beautiful place. T uh, really time to get away and get refreshed, recharged before fall gets going. So we won't meet next week, but I encourage you to keep reading the book of Acts chapter 6. Uh, the next section deals with Stephen specifically, and um, <clears throat> he'll be accused of blasphemy. So here's this godly man full of the Holy Spirit, full of a great reputation and wisdom, and, and he's going to be falsely accused. It can happen to anybody. And so we'll talk about that in two weeks. But uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege to be with our friends tonight. Thank you for their lives, for their faithfulness to serve you. And, and I pray that you would fill them with uh, the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. <clears throat> fill them with hope. And help us to keep pressing on, forgetting those things which are behind. We press on towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Literally, in Jesus' name, we press on. We do pray for the hostages in Haiti. They'd be released soon. We pray for other uh, world uh, tragedies and the ones in Afghanistan with uh, people being um, brutalized by the Taliban. We pray for the president of this country and vice president, senators, Congress, men and women of uh, the military, and of course, police, men and women all over the United States. Thank you for our first responders and God, bring peace to this worn toward world as they turn their eyes upon Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Pastor Mark Hensley with my beautiful wife, Laura, saying uh, have a great rest of your evening and we'll see you uh, hopefully soon, maybe Sunday. I continue a new sermon series Sunday and I'd love to have you here uh, in person. Bye folks. <laughs>